right, let me introduce you to the third member of this traveling road show, the amazing Karen Patel. Karen is president of Patel & Company, and few consultants can match her record of direct on-the-ground ex expertise and experience and success. Having served as a campaign manager, communications director, fundraiser, researcher, field operative for candidates at nearly every level of the ballot, Karen's expertise is born out of a decade of practical hands-on campaign experience. We have brought you today the most successful Democrat consultant in America. In 2012, she helped pass marriage equality and the DREAM Act in Maryland, and she has worked with over 75 women to run and win in public office. Previously, Karen served as a campaign director at the Democrat Congressional Campaign Committee, the DCCC, and as a regional director for Emily's List, Karen has recruited and trained more Democrat women for public office. Please welcome the Women's Campaign School's best-looking board member, Karen Patel. Thank you, Deb. Hello, sisters. I have five sisters at home, but now I feel like I have five plus a thousand. So welcome to the family, ladies. So I am here to be the reality check, because that's what I am at the campaign school. I am the reality check. But before we do that, I'm going to have you do a little exercise with me. Everyone, breathe. If you get in politics, you're going to do a lot of that. So let me tell you a story about uh, how I think I, I think I got into politics, but I don't know if I am in politics. So I was in school, I was in college, uh, a student of history. I love history. And I decided maybe I should minor in political science. So I took some political science classes, political theory. Has anyone heard any of these books? These are the books I was told to study at what was supposedly the liberal Eastern College that I went to. Theories of government, that was a good one. Uh, I also read The Prince by Machiavelli, The Art of War. These are the books I was taught in my political science classes. And in my political science classes, I was one of the few women in most of them. And I started thinking, really? Is this what they're preparing me to do? Divide, conquer, treat my enemies, bring my enemies closer? And then one day, I had a political science professor. And he said, class, we're gonna start outside today. Come on, everyone, let's go. And we get outside, and he says, get on the ground. And OK, I get on the ground. And then he says, get up off the ground. Take a deep breath. Everyone breathe with me. Ready? I'm going to teach you about sun salutations. <laughs> and I thought, is this political theory? Am I sociology? Am I in what, what class is this? That certainly was a political science professor. And wouldn't you know it if the class went from 17 to 7, because half the students who wanted political science thought, what is this wackadoo? So ladies, please, run for office. Be my wackadoo. <laughs> There's not enough of those in, in college, and they don't teach you enough of that. And, and that's the problem. So could I see a show of hands, anyone who thought at all in the last two days that maybe I could do that. Maybe I could do that. Maybe I could run. Maybe I could have a stronger opinion than I voice normally. I appreciate that. Raise those hands. Wonderful. Now look at the person next to you and say, please run. <laughs> you know what I love about events with women? When we ask for a conversation to happen, it happens. So right up on the screen here, there are two very strong statements. Politics are, by, are determined by those who show up. Thank you for showing up this weekend. Thank you, Marianne, for having us here this weekend. Because you showed up. 
now let's have a little reality check because I'm the queen of reality at the Women's Campaign School. Everyone gets to go in and talk about, oh, these are great issues and this is how you should talk. And then I come in and go, this is how much it's gonna cost, <laughs> okay? This year, women learned that if we're, what does this say? If we're not at the table, we're on the menu. So let's talk about that menu. 2010, I will call them extremists, were elected to all forms of government. Within three months of them being elected, three months, ladies, they were, they were sworn in in January, and by the middle of March, early April, they had introduced 916 pieces of legislation in 49 state legislatures to restrict a woman's access to health care. In three months. You want to know what was on that menu? You. Here's my thigh. Vaginal ultrasounds. Forced vaginal ultrasounds. Now my arm is on the menu. We're gonna allow doctors to withhold information from patients if we think it might lead to them getting an abortion. No such thing as a Hippocratic Oath. Abstinence-only sex education. We're gonna redefine the word rape. And we're gonna cut off funding for Planned Parenthood. So I am a political consultant. I know people think we're awful human beings. I am not Karl Rove. We are not all Karl Rove. <laughs> Let me tell you about my political consulting. Let's call it my restaurant. I'd like to invite you to have a meal in my restaurant. Let me just introduce you to some of the menu. Diane, are you here? You're going to love this one. We're gonna bypass the FDA, and we're gonna ban plastic chemical additives that are in things like baby bottles. You know who introduced that bill? A woman. When Iraq and Afghanistan veterans were coming home and finding themselves in court for felony, for, for drug possession, for domestic abuse, Someone said, hmm, what's going on here? Let's create a court because these guys clearly have PTSD and don't deserve to go to jail. They deserve therapy. They deserve help. <laughs> Who sponsored that bill, ladies? A woman. <laughs> when children in poverty had no chance of going to college, a bill was sponsored that said, you know what, we're gonna give any child of poverty who stays out of trouble and gets good grades, two years of free college. Who sponsored that bill? A woman. That's right. That is the menu at my restaurant, and come enjoy. Please join me. We'd love to have you dine there. Slide, please. Okay. The other thing is, I'm, I'm here to ask you to run for office. But I'm also here to ask you to live a political life. And that doesn't always mean you're going to run for office, but I want to show you a path to get there. So, number one, if you leave here and do anything today, if you are not already registered to vote, please vote. Please go register to vote. The second thing on this screen says vote in primaries. Thank you. Not enough women vote in primaries. And let me explain to you the importance of voting in a primary. When you go and you vote in a general election, how many choices do you have? And who determined those choices for you? The primaries. So there was this uh, lovely man in Indiana this year. His name was Richard Murdoch. He believes that rape babies our gift. Do you know how Richard Murdoch was put on the ballot in the general election? 
He won a primary, ladies. He was the choice that was put up for all of us to decide on in Indiana. Anyone from Indiana here? Streaming, I hope. <laughs> Primaries are important. They're very important. And if you are in a state where there's no party registration, you can walk in and vote in a primary. If you are in a state where you are an independent, oftentimes you can walk in, register for whichever party you want to vote for that day, and then just disaffiliate. There is all sorts of ways to do this. And my favorite analogy yesterday was the soap opera. Inform yourself. The other goal I'm going to have here today is to make you a better consumer and producer of information. If you inform yourself, there's no political ad that can pull the wool over your eyes. So let's talk about informing ourselves, okay? <laughs> How do you do that? I mean, Marianne was perfect yesterday. Read. Read, listen, pay attention. If you don't pay attention, you are stuck watching these ridiculous ads that people like myself are paid to produce. <laughs> that said, I'm going to make you a better consumer of that information. We're going to talk about that. Can we go to the next slide, please? Number two, hold your elected officials accountable. See, I've got this picture over here of uh, someone at the computer, and there's emails flying through on them. Write a letter to the editor of your newspaper. Here's the thing about people who run for office. Too often, they are, they are people who have a very high opinion of themselves, and they get very upset when someone isn't happy with them, when someone doesn't like them. Write a letter to the editor, and now everyone who reads that newspaper is going to know your opinion. Thank them for what they've done. If they have done something that you appreciate, let them know. Not enough people say thank you to elected officials. We're so busy criticizing them. There are a lot of amazing people out there doing good work. That's right. Let me tell you one woman you should be thanking. And this goes to staying informed and understanding. And this is what I hope you all come out of here with. Becoming political, whether or not you run for office or not, but here's where strategists like myself come in, okay? There is something to the art of war. It's about strategy. I learned that. And strategy is understanding how the process works. So when that bill in Virginia said, hey, we're going to force women to have vaginal ultrasounds before they can have an abortion, A really smart woman named State Senator Janet Howell said, I know how to play this system. You want to play that game? Great. Here's something called an amendment. And this amendment, you ready for this? I'm going to read it so I don't get this wrong. If you want to pass a bill that requires women to have vaginal, forced vaginal ultrasounds, here's what you're going to get, boys. We're going to require men to have a rectal exam and cardiac stress test before obtaining a prescription for Viagra. <laughs> Janet Howell knows how to play the game. I wrote her a check that same day. I emailed her and said, good job. I posted on my Facebook page what she had done. I tweeted what she had done, and I said, thank you, Janet Howell. Do the same. Do the same. Because when that vaginal ultrasound bill came up, I tweeted it. I put it on my Facebook. I let all my friends know that this bill was being voted on in Virginia. It doesn't matter. It's not all just Congress, folks. It's the state legislative level. That's why we need more women in office. We need more Janet Howells in office. 
Start a petition. It sounds old school, right? Go online. You'd be surprised how many petitions there are. And let me tell you, a lot of my clients will call me and freak out. Oh my God, two people emailed me about this bill. And I'm always like, okay, yep, yep, I get it. Two people emailed you. I need you to calm down. But in reality, you can freak them out. Post it, share it, tweet it. That is part of being informed and being a consumer and being a producer of information. Share it. The other thing I've got up here, it says call and email. Mm, not every state representative out there even knows what Twitter or Facebook is. So you still have to do the old school way of getting, in, getting informed and informing them. So if you want, just one thing that you can do when you leave here today is to thank and chastise. That's one way of living a political life. Next slide, please. Okay, this is, uh, this is my life here. I am a professional campaign operative. I am not Karl Rove, although Deb's people might think I'm someone awful like that. <laughs> but there are people out there who who make a living on campaigns. There are people who volunteer their time on campaigns. And that's what the Women's Campaign School does. We can teach you to do both. In 19, I'm gonna age myself, 1995, I went to my very first campaign school with Emily's List, which is a, pro a, women, a women's organization that elects pro-choice Democratic women. I ended up ended up being their political director some years later, but it started with a campaign school, and they taught me how to raise money, and they taught me how to raise money for women running for office. And I would like to just say to everyone right now that we had some great successes this year in, in the United States Senate. As a Democrat, I think we had some great successes. Let me just tell you about the people behind the people. Tammy Baldwin, first open lesbian elected to the United States Senate. <laughs> Campaign manager, Karen Johansson, the first person that ever taught me how to raise money in 1995. John Tester the dirt farmer in Montana who was just re-elected to the Senate. His campaign, Dana Swanson, same, a woman I met in 2000 working on another campaign in Montana. These are all, there are women behind these candidates. Heidi Heitkamp in North Dakota, a race we never thought we would win. A woman named Tessa Gould ran that campaign. These, pe these are women who are living political lives. They're not on the, they're not on the technical front line. They're the ones pushing the, one, the women in front of, behind. So this, these are just all different experiences that you can go have to lead a political life. Okay, staff a campaign office. Let me just tell you one thing about, a, as a former campaign manager, volunteers are gold. Gold. And let me explain to you why because we're gonna talk a little bit about Citizens United right now. Why does it cost so much money to run for Congress, for Senate, for President, for City Council? It really depends on where you live. Because in this world, as Deb said, of tweets and Facebook and going from 16 and a half minute attention span to 15, well guess what? Commercials are 30 seconds for a reason. And the problem is you need to communicate with as many people as you possibly can with the dollars that you have. On a smaller race, you can knock on thousands of doors and that is great. The larger race, you need to communicate. That means you need to go on TV. You need to go on the radio. You need to use direct mail. You need to have a field program where people are knocking on the doors and ladies, that is expensive. For example, Elizabeth Warren, the new senator from Massachusetts, <laughs> lives in a state where people 
get their television from three different markets. If you live on the eastern side of Massachusetts, you watch television that comes out of Boston. If you live in western Massachusetts, you get what's called Springfield television. That's Springfield, Massachusetts. If you live in southeastern Massachusetts, you watch television from my home state of Rhode Island. So now, Elizabeth Warren needs to communicate with everyone in Massachusetts. She has to talk to people in Springfield, which also expands into New York. So now she's talking to people who aren't even gonna vote for her. She has to talk to people in Rhode Island who can't vote for her, and she's gotta talk to Boston. For one week of television in Boston, it is $356,000. That is why campaigns are so expensive. In Los Angeles, dare I even tell you what it costs? <laughs> $1.3 million for a week of TV. Okay? Now, if you're lucky enough to run in a place like, you know, South Carolina, <laughs> or Heidi High Camp in North Dakota, $600,000 will get her weeks of television. So you can see the, the disparity in where you run is uh, really why it's so expensive and why they say this is an expensive Senate seat. In Virginia, the most expensive Senate seat this year, $60 million in ads. They said that if you ran all of the television ads that in one sequence, that ran in Virginia, you would be watching television ads for two years. Wow. Citizens United, folks. 65% <laughs> of the ads run in Virginia were coming from outside groups. Something to think about. Okay, canvassing. These are things that you are gonna do on a campaign and here's why it's so important. Everything I just talked about. Why it's so expensive to run for office. Why do you think we love volunteers? You're free. <laughs> the people I loved most beside my candidate on my campaigns that I would run, there's always, every campaign's got that one woman who shows up every day and will answer the phone. God, we love her. <laughs> she brings donuts and makes us all fat and Kentucky Fried Chicken and it's awful, but we love her because she shows up every day. We love those people who say, sure, I'm gonna go knock on doors for you. I'm gonna, the personal contact to say that candidate knocked on my door means so much to people. You don't even have to leave home anymore. You can log in to a, a, a candidate's website. I'll use Barack Obama as an example, dot com. I had nothing to do on election day because my work thankfully was done. I logged in, I said sure, I'll call people. A program popped up, it gave me the name of everyone to call, what the message was, and their phone number. And I would just click yes, called, and it went right back into their database. Yes, I called them from the comfort of my own home. You don't even have to leave home anymore, ladies. Okay, next slide please. Now, some of these stickers you might recognize. Some you might like, some you might despise. It depends. But here's other ways that you can lead a political life. Testify before an, a committee. If there's an issue you care about, testify. You can start your own political organization. You know what? There's no one out there talking about this issue. I'm gonna be the one talking about this issue. Hold a fundraiser. We already talked about how expensive campaigns are. Hold a fundraiser for a candidate. Hold a fundraiser for an organization. Start, start raising money for a cause. And here's these see, these, see all these logos down here? Every single one of these logos were affected by a woman or a group of women. So let's look at this first one. Does everyone know what this is? I think they used to call it the tipper sticker. I think Prince. Uh, song Little Nikki started this whole shirt, this whole problem, right? Before she was the vice president's wife, Tipper Gore 
walked by her daughter's room and heard Prince's little Nikki playing and heard the word masturbation. And now we all have a sticker on our music. A group of moms got together and upset the balance of the music industry. DAT. Does everyone know what DAT is? Don't ask, don't tell. Now, don't ask, don't tell was a policy from the military that said, if you are gay or lesbian, we're not going to ask you. Don't tell us. We don't want to know. It was in place for 20 some odd years. Do you know why it's gone now? Because a congresswoman from San Diego rose to power to become the chairwoman of the subcommittee on military personnel and held the first hearing in 15 years on Don't Ask, Don't Tell, and within six months it was, it was overturned. <laughs> now the next one may not be as uh, recognizable to folks. Pass a VAWA that protects all. Does everyone know what VAWA is? The Violence Against Women Act. It is up for reauthorization by Congress every five years or so. It was up for reauthorization last election season. And the people that we did not thank put up an amendment that said, we're going to expand the Violence Against Women Act to include gay and lesbian couples and Native American women. And it was voted down in the Senate. And then some Native American women from the Midwest came out and said, oh, no, you don't and went to Congress and testified. The next one, Mothers Against Drunk Driving, started by a California woman after her child was killed by a drunk driver, and no one's life has ever been the same. She put a face and a name to an issue no one ever talked about. All of these ladies were done by women. You are the next group of women who are going to do the next big thing. Next slide, please. And if you need more motivation, here's a few fantastic women. Top, my home state, Gina Raimondo. Gina Raimondo was a, capital, a venture capitalist doing quite well for herself. She's this girl who grew up in an Italian-American family in Rhode Island, the kind of house where mom and dad lived. She never had her own bed because grandma and grandpa lived there too. <laughs> she was smart. She was very smart and did not want to go to the public school. She fought her way to go to uh, what's called LaSalle Academy in Rhode Island. And in order to get there, there was no school bus. So she had to take public transportation to get to LaSalle Academy. So she did, and she graduated from LaSalle Academy and then she graduated from Harvard, and then she graduated from Yale, and then she graduated from Oxford. And then she went and made some money in New York. And then she moved her family home and said, I'm gonna start a venture cap, the first venture capital firm in Rhode Island, the state with, at that time, the highest unemployment rate in the country. And then she was reading a newspaper article one day, and she read that the RIPTA bus, which is the Rhode Island public transportation bus that she used to take to LaSalle Academy was being cut because the state was near bankruptcy. And she got angry. She got angry. And she said, well, hell, I'm going to go run for general treasurer because I can do a much better job than these guys have been doing for years. The state shouldn't go bankrupt and that bus shouldn't go away. And now she is the most popular politician in the state, being talked about as a candidate for governor. She started a financial program to teach people how to invest, how to balance their checkbooks, how to not get foreclosed on. These are things that we can be doing. The next person, a very dear friend of mine, Anthea Martin Nesbitt. She went in for gallbladder surgery some years ago, came out, a lot of pain. When they went in there, they said, oh, you've got adhesions. Does anyone know what that is? I'm glad you do, and I'll bet you only do because of someone like Anthea Martin Nesbitt. And here's why. You know, back when I was in college, 
I had to write a thesis, and it was about the mental state of the rise of middle class women in the late 1800s and early 1900s. Yes, I'm a history dork. And the thing that they kept doing to women back then was, wow, do you, she, needs, she must need, you know, she just needs some drugs or something because she's, they used to use it as the word hysteria. You ever see movies that talk about the old days and they say, oh, hysteria, give her something. Well, she's not hysterical, she's exhausted. You just gave her a 75 pound vacuum and told her to go keep her house clean. And now she's slugging this thing up and down the stairs. She's, she's got a great new oven, isn't that great? But now she spends half the day stoking the fire and bringing coal in the house. She's exhausted, she's not hysterical, but people didn't believe them. People didn't believe women. They put them in a, you know, the sanitarium or, and, and now you think that's over. Someone like Anthea Martin Nesbitt went out and said, okay, we have this thing called adhesions and they are painful. And what they are, if you don't know what they are, they are these cobweb-like results of uh, surgery. A lot of women get them from having a hysterectomy, from having uh, cesarean sections, and it's, they, they grow and they are painful. And the thing is, she was out, she's a nurse, and she was out there looking for someone else to talk to about this. And all she kept hearing from women is, my doctor thinks I'm lying. He's saying there's nothing wrong with me, just wants to give me more drugs. It's the same thing. She went out, she had to find someone in Australia to find a, a support group. Took a support group from Australia and started it in the United States. She has passed legislation at the city level, the county level, the state level, and the national level. Now there is a national adhesion, there's to actually tomorrow in one city is an adhesion awareness day. One woman decided when doctors say no, I'm going to tell them better. We all know the next woman, Sandra Fluck. <laughs> well, we, 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 we wouldn't have known her because Congress decided her testimony didn't matter when they put a panel of all men talking about contraception for women. And then our friend Rush Limbaugh called her a slut and talked about her sexual preference and proclivities. And now we all know her name and we're clapping because she put her name on the line and she said, I'll be the one to go testify that it cost me $3,000 a year as a student to get birth control. She's not ashamed. Why should she be made to feel ashamed? She put her name out there. It just starts with putting your name on the line. Patty Murray, she is, if you don't know, one of the most powerful women in the United States Senate. Do you know how it started? She was a mom, and she was really upset that they were gonna cut preschool programs in her state in Washington. She went to her state legislat uh, legislator and to her school board, and one man, it took, sometimes it always just takes one man, doesn't it? One man said to her, you're just a mom in tennis shoes. She ran for the school board and won. Now she's the most powerful woman in the United States Senate. Sometimes, ladies, you just gotta beat them at their own game, right? Okay, next slide, please. So, here's the things about everyone I just talked about. Here's, here's what makes them such powerful people. They all decided to put their name out there. They decided to run. This is another way that you can live a political life. You can run for office. You know, I don't know if everyone remembers this little group, because I think the Tea Party has uh, gotten all the attention now, but do you remember this group called the Christian Coalition? Do you think they started by running for United States Senate? Christian Coalition was developed in the early, late 70s, early 80s, by Pat Robertson and his friends. And where did they start? School board, city council, state legislature. And then they came to power and they changed our lives forever with Newt Gingrich and the Contract on America. I call it the Contract on America. <laughs> so, find a position. Find, find it. What are you? Are you excited about school? Do you want to join the PTA? 
something in your classroom not make you happy? <laughs> do you not want your child to have to do duck and cover on a nuclear? <laughs> Run for school board. Find something that you think you can, you can win and be relatable to. Call your local political party. Call them and say, hey, what's, the, what's going on in the next election? I think I'm a good candidate. I'd like to talk to you. And remember, you don't always have to agree with everything they say. I think it was really interesting that we sat here yesterday and the panel of every political party, I agreed with something that came out of everyone's mouth yesterday. And I think what Deb just said is, let them know you are the person for the job. No one's better than you. Go in there with confidence. If you, if you believe in yourself, they will believe in you. And be authentic. This is my other part of, at the campaign school. Teaching candidates to be authentic. There's, you can tell when someone is not being themselves. You can just tell. Think about the candidates that, that you've liked in the past and think about what you liked about them or what you didn't like about them, right? So do you think Richard Murdoch was being himself when he said he thinks, yes, rape is, yeah, and rape is legitimate, Todd Aiken? He was being himself. He was very authentic. <laughs> thing is, sometimes it works against you. That's the other thing. You have to be an authentic candidate. If you're authentic, you'll never disappoint yourself and you'll never disappoint voters. And now the next part is, it's voters and that's when my reality check comes back. You have to win an election. You have to get people to vote for you. You have to be likable. You have to be credible. Next slide, please. So here's the thing. I want everyone in this room to raise your hands. Raise your hands. And I only want you to lower your hands when I say something that does not apply to you. Does everyone in this room have a history? If you don't, lower your hands. <laughs> Does everyone in this room have friends? If you don't, lower your hands. Does every woman in this room have an opinion? <laughs> oh, look, look around the room, ladies. You are all qualified to run for office. <laughs> Next slide, please. <laughs> All right, we already said it, you are all ready to run. So I'm not gonna leave here until I get some people who are gonna run. Your background gives you the credibility to run for office. Think about it. I want everyone to think right now. My name is, I care about this. Everyone say it out loud. Ready, fill in the blank, go. My name is, I care about that's your issue that you're going to run on. And you're going to tell me when I leave here today that that's what you're going to run for. You have to make a personal connection with voters. You have to make them understand. People, when they know who you are as a human being, you, the distance between you becomes less. And that's what persuading voters is all about. And yesterday, I'm not, I don't quite remember who said it, but it's true. 80% of the electorate's minds are made up. That's what we teach you at the Women's Campaign School. There are people who are with you, and there are people who are against you, and they're never gonna be with you. And unfortunately, part of all this money that we're spending on campaigns is talking to 10% of voters. So the people who agree with you on the issues are gonna be there for you. Recruit them to be your volunteers, to be your, your personal circle to write your money, write your checks, raise your money, knock on doors, because you need to raise money to talk to that 10%. And oftentimes, votes are counted, and I don't know what the outcome is right now, but for example, uh, Congresswoman Gabrielle Gifford's congressional district right now is in a recount, and the Democrat was up 122 votes the last time I looked. That's why volunteering on a campaign is so important. That's why running for office is so important. You are qualified. Next slide, please. So now let's talk about it. How do you talk to this 10% of voters? How do you talk to people? How do, you, how do you make the decision? Okay, I'm running, I'm doing this. 
Now, now what do I do? You have to talk about who you are in your background. You have to know who you are. And it's not just about, okay, I am, I am a social worker, I am a teacher. The first thing I do when I sign a new client is I sit down and I say, okay, let's talk. I want to know everything there is to know about you. I ask questions like, did you cry the first day of school? Who was your favorite teacher and why? Was there anything in class that you were really bad at? You know, what were, sometimes you don't remember the things that influenced your life. Someone else has to bring that out of you. That's the first thing you do. You sit down, you take inventory of yourself, and you figure out, who am I? What you care about and why does it matter? You know, oftentimes I've had to say to candidates, I know, I know, you, you really want to talk about uh, this particular issue. You re I know you really want to talk about, uh, you know, children's health care. But the 10% of voters, they want to hear about jobs in the economy. And so how do we mend them? How do we meld them together, weld them together, build on it? How do we make the issue that you want to talk about relevant to voters? when their minds are somewhere else. It all works together. You're taking a needle, you're putting a piece of thread through it, and you are gonna go out there and sow your candidacy. Why are you the best person? The number th one thing people will say to you is, why are you running for office? And if you can't answer that question, if you're, uh, first question I always ask people, why are you running for office? If you can't go boom, 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 then you're not gonna win. First thing, so now we need to know. We've already taken our personal inventory. We've talked about our issues. Now we have to figure out how do we take those two and make them relevant to voters when they say, why are you running for office? And why are you the best person to represent me? Because at that point, it's not about you anymore. It's about the voters, and they want to know. If you're running for school committee, what's your position on X, Y, and Z? Vouchers, private schools. If you're running for city council or town council, how do you feel about potholes? <laughs> because I have one in my front yard. I know, I know, I know you really care about uh, schools, but I wonder about the potholes. Can we talk about that? You don't always get to decide what you talk about. Voters are the ones making the choice and the decision, and elections, ladies, are about a choice. Do you know how many people have knocked on my door and never said, will you vote for me? Will you write me a $500 check? and then stop, don't say anything, silence, <laughs> people hate silence. Hi, can you write me a thousand dollar check? That would be great. Make them say no, make them say yes. Can I get your vote? Make them answer you. You have to ask people for their vote. Next slide, please. So let's talk about being an authentic candidate. This is the part where I'm gonna make you a better consumer of Commercials, the things that everyone hates during the election season. How many people in this room, raise your hand, said, oh my God, I don't want to see another political commercial this year? I guarantee you, the political commercials I'm about to show you, you probably never saw anything like them this year because of Citizens United. These are all commercials that were run in elections before Citizens United. But let's just talk about these, these people up here. This is a group that I think the world of. The first one is Stephanie Rawlings-Blake. She is the mayor of Baltimore. Anyone from Maryland? All right. Stephanie Rawlings-Blake is the mayor of Baltimore. She is the daughter of a civil rights leader. And my, my, the reason why I just want to talk before I get into that, why I chose all of these people. Not everyone decides, oh, I'm going to run for office because I care about child poverty or I care about this one issue. Some people run for office out of sheer just the, the feeling that I owe this. This is a public service. I need to do public service. Two people on this are public servants. Not, neither of them said, I'm running because of this. It was, I feel this deep need to serve the public and protect my state or my city. And it's okay. They're, they're going to have opinions on all different issues, but not everyone runs on an issue. They run because this is what they were born to do. 
and Stephanie Rawlings Blake is one of them. The other is Stephanie Herseth Sandlin in South Dakota. She's a person where, I will tell you this, she lost her re-election for Congress in 2010. She was a, her father was a uh, state senator, ran for governor, and was one of the nastiest campaigns she'd ever lived through. She was 16 years old. Her father was $300,000 in debt because of this campaign. The negative ads never stopped, and she swore if she ever ran, she would never run a negative ad in her life. And I can proudly say that she had three terms in Congress, never ran a negative ad, and unfortunately lost to a Tea Party candidate last year, but stuck to her ideals. <laughs> Ruth Ann Minner. This is a woman who, when you see her story, you will think, I know her. She's the kind of person who should be running for office. Let's see, Kamala Harris. I think there's a lot of Californians here. Now, let's talk about this one. Watch her ad closely. She's talking to 10%, but she's talking to you. See what she says about incarceration rates because maybe you notice it, but the average voter might not. You'll, you'll see what I mean when you look at it. John Hickenlooper, oh Lord Hick. They call him Hick in Colorado. So here's the thing, anybody from Colorado in the room? Here's the thing about Colorado, and this is what's wrong with politics sometimes. Oftentimes politics say, do not be your authentic self. At the Women's Campaign School we say, no, please be your authentic self. John Hickenlooper is a former geologist and, you know, the guy decided, I'm going to start brewing my own beer. <laughs> Brewery, opened restaurants in Denver, and decided, I'm going to run for mayor of Denver. Denver is not Colorado. There's something called the Western Slope and the Eastern Plains, and everyone in Colorado, every political consultant says, well, if you're going to run statewide, you got to put a cowboy boots on and ride a horse, or else they're never going to vote for you out in the Western Slope especially not some guy named Hickenlooper, who <laughs> brews beer in Denver. I think John Hickenlooper's ad that we're gonna show you sort of goes right into the face of that, that says, okay, I know you people think this is what I've gotta do, but I've gotta be me. And it's, it's a joke. So, and then the other one is Michael Hancock, the new mayor of Baltimore, uh, sorry, of Denver. A child of poverty, extreme poverty is now the mayor of Denver. And his story is compelling. And the reason I'm showing you all of these is because your story is compelling. Everyone's story is different, but they matter. And there's a reason why every single one of you should run for office, and there's a reason why every single one of these people should have run for office. So on that note, I'm making you a better consumer of the ads I'm about to show you. So I want you to look at these ads, and I want you to, to really look at them. Don't just look at them as political ads, but look at them to see who these people are. And see if you can tell who they are. And then I want you to go out and figure out why and how we can get rid of Citizens United so that we can get ads like this back up and get rid of the stuff we saw on TV this year. And then after that, I've got a little message from some women in Congress, some women in the United States Senate, some women and county commissioners, they want you to run for office. So, gentlemen, if you could put the video up, please. A family's history. Her father, Lars Herseth, served in the state senate. Her grandfather, Ralph Herseth, was governor. Her grandmother, Lorna, secretary of state. Growing up in South Dakota, Stephanie Herseth was taught the importance of public service and she learned well. Georgetown University Law School, working in the federal courts in Pierre and Aberdeen, and leading the South Dakota Farmers Union Foundation. Now she's ready to bring the values she learned at home to Congress. I'm Stephanie Herseth, and it's time our seniors had a Medicare prescription drug benefit that reduces out-of-pocket costs. No more delays on country of origin labeling. Our consumers and producers need it now. And our veterans deserve fully funded health care and disability benefits. You can call or see my website for more details. I approve this message because we have only one voice in the House of Representatives, and I want to make it count.
and she's California's most innovative district attorney. Kamala Harris created a long overdue child assault unit, the first ever environmental justice unit, a national model for early intervention, and dramatically higher conviction rates for violent crime. Our justice system needs drastic repair. Early intervention leaves room in our prisons for the violent criminals who should be there. I did it in San Francisco. As Attorney General, I can do it across California. How do you sum up a life? My father left when I was six. We were 10 kids in public housing, then homeless in a motel room. I've had a brother die of AIDS and a sister murdered, but I never gave up. I went to college, then graduate school while working two jobs. I created programs for 11,000 inner city kids, job training for adults, then was president of the city council. I'm Michael Hancock, and we are all Denver, and no one should be left behind. The story begins with a young girl growing up on a small farm in Sussex County. At age 16, she has to leave school to help her parents on the farm. It's a difficult time in my life, but I learned to keep moving forward. A widow at age 32, Ruth Ann Minner earned her GED and took college courses while working two jobs. I couldn't afford daycare, so my three sons just tagged along while I was out surveying crops. From those beginnings, Ruth Ann Minter went on to make a difference. Running a small business, serving in the state legislature, then eight years as lieutenant governor, where she worked to reduce class sizes and preserve thousands of acres of open space. As governor, Ruth Ann Minter will shift education dollars from the bureaucracy to the classroom, pass HMO reform so patients can choose their own doctor, and continue to preserve the beauty of Delaware. Ruth Ann Minner for governor, keeping Delaware first. Baltimore was changing, and civil rights activist Pete Rawlings taught his daughter to take great pride in her city. When Stephanie was seven or eight, if she saw somebody dropping trash on the street, she'd tell them to pick it up. Stephanie Rawlings Blake, the youngest ever elected to city council, now city council president. Strong gangs and weak schools will not be our legacy. Expanding after school activities and working to reduce dropout rates. Keep Stephanie Rawlings Blake as city council president. I'm John Hickenlooper, and everybody tells me I have to ride a horse in a political ad. Now, I've been a geologist, a businessman, and a mayor. I've created over a 1,000 restaurant jobs, eliminated $200 million in deficits, and turned a city around with innovation, jobs, and cost cutting. These are hard times, and we need a governor who can help all of Colorado get back in the saddle. Not sure this is what they meant by riding a horse, though. I ran for Secretary of State. I ran for the United States Senate. I ran for the California State Assembly. I ran for the United States Senate. United States Congress. President of the Colorado Senate. I was in the State Assembly. I was a state senator for 12 years. A social worker. And I had never run for office before. Gwen was in the Senate. I loved being a state senator. Then the congressional seat opened up. Gwen was running. You better believe it. Emily's list asked me to run for state senate. That's right. I thought her senate seat would be tough, but I thought I had a good chance at winning. Lena called, wanting me to run for her assembly seat. Girl, you can do it. I thought to myself, you must be crazy. I'm Gwen Moore, United States Congresswoman. Lena Taylor, now a state senator. Tamara Grigsby, state representative. I'm working to ensure the integrity and fairness of our elections. I'm working on improving access to health care. To keep our air and water clean. I'm working on protecting reproductive rights. To make our schools better. It's important for us to see women in chief executive positions. I know what a difference it makes when women are included in making policy. When women are involved in the political process, it makes a difference 
in so many ways. It makes a difference for our families. For our reproductive freedom. For our children. For our economy. It makes a difference on education. I ran for the House of Representatives. I ran for state representative. County supervisor. The Georgia General Assembly. I ran for the school board. The county commissioner. I was a county commissioner, a state representative, a state senator, and a U.S. congresswoman. All of those campaigns and experiences helped me when I ran for the U.S. Senate. I tell you what, I could really use more women serving in the legislature. We need more women running for office. If more women run, more women win. And that's great for all of us. Come on, run. Just run. We have got to have more women running. If I can do it, you can do it. Come on. The answer is you. 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 Mm-hmm. I'm asking you to consider running for office. Hey, you. You've been asked. Run. Run. To change the makeup of our legislature. Come on. Run. To change things for the better. Run. To change the way we participate in politics. Run. To change the future for our daughters and our sons. On behalf of the Women's Campaign School at Yale, please run. Change the run. face of America, ladies. <laughs> Patel, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Wow, wow, thank you, thank you, thank you. I feel so much, you know, already when people had asked me, you know, what is your goal for the weekend? It was to feel the way I feel now and to feel that you feel the way you feel now. And uh, I'm very, very excited. I tell you what we're gonna do right now. We're gonna take a 15 minute break. And then when we come back, I wanna wrap things up. I think a lot of us uh, from this sort of transformational world, higher consciousness, spirituality, recovery, personal growth, yoga, et cetera. Um, whoever we are, we have learned a lot this weekend and we have some real ideas about how we would do it our way. We'll be back in 15 minutes. Thank you so much. That works out.